Hey Meeple people, how's it going? On today's video, we are going to be playing Dwarf Romantic. This is a game for one to six players, and it takes 30 to 60 minutes to play, and it's for ages eight and up, and it is by Pegasus Spiel Games. Now, currently, at the time of this recording, this is a Spiel des Arts nominee, which is pretty cool. And apparently it's hard to get for some reason. Uh, I don't know why, but it is, and we somehow got a copy because we were at a friendly local game store, and so it was awesome. But uh, we're going to play this today, and then at the end of the play, we're going to go ahead and talk to you about our... Uh, the, like the pros and cons of the game and we'll come back like midway through the game and get a little bit of a feel for it but uh right now we're gonna go to sarah and she's gonna give us a little quick overview before we start playing dwarf romantic the board game sarah will you will you uh help us out sure so a couple things one uh i'm not a hundred percent sure that that's really how you pronounce it. It does seem to be in maybe a foreign language or a non-English language. Um, so hopefully- German, I think. Okay, maybe it's German. I'm not exactly sure that we're pronouncing it correctly. If we're not, sorry. Um, another thing is it is a sort of a legacy-ish style game. So there's components that are in the box that we have not discovered yet. Um, we are not going to spoil those for you right now, although, um, in this game, we are probably going to be able to unlock like the first box. Um, so if we show that later, we will give like a spoiler heads up. Um, Look but away. just a couple things there at the front end. So this is probably called Dwarf Romantic. Uh, like Nick said, it's a game for one to six players. Um, frankly, I'm not exactly sure how six people would play this. I wouldn't want to play this with more than two or three players. But I don't know, maybe your group just enjoys holding hands and figuring things out together. We're punching each other in the face <laughs> of arguments. So the way that this game works is that we have task tiles. Um, the first three turns of the game are just to establish tasks. So we've done that off screen. Um, and then if ever there are fewer than three active tasks at a time, then you have to spend your next turn to establish tasks until there are three active tasks. So these tax, task tiles come from this stack over here. So they've got this little um, dialogue bubble on them. And what happens is you just like turn one over. It has a symbol on it, which tells you which of these tiles are gonna go with it. So we turned over this from here and we uh, turned over this from here. And so now we know we are attempting to get five of these sort of like housing tiles connected to this one here. Um, once we have gotten our task, we're going to discuss where we best think that it should go. So Nick and I said, we believe that the best place for this one is right here. So we've put it there. Um, if there are already three task tiles out at the beginning of your turn, anywhere on the game board, three active tasks, then instead of turning over a task tile, you will turn over a landscape tile. The landscape tiles have all different kinds of landscapes on them. Um, but what we are going to do with this is, again, discuss where we think that this would best go. There are a few hard and fast rules you have to abide by. Like, for example, I couldn't just railroad literally this tile into something else. Um, it has to either connect to an existing railroad, maybe like this, or I have to put it in a way, in such a way that I could continue this railroad. I can't just dead end the railroad. The same is true for rivers. I couldn't just, if I had just drawn this tile, I couldn't just decide to like smash this river into something. Um, and we are, uh, like I said, we are attempting to meet these tasks. So this one here, the railroad task that we currently have in play means that we need six tiles that are um, continuing the rail line. So we could put this one here or here, and that would help us with our railroad task that we're attempting to complete. Additionally, we're also attempting to complete a housing situation where there are five housing tiles, um, including this one? Yes. Including this one. Connected to it. Um, so yeah. it would be my opinion that this tile we've just turned over would be good to place right here because not only does it continue the railroad, but also there's this tiny little bit of house right here. So later, if we're able to put a, 
a landscape tile here that has house on this edge and on this edge, then we will sort of group these houses together and be able to work on our housing task as well. So that's your that's the whole turn. You flip one of these landscape tiles over, you discuss where it's going to go, you place it where you've decided it's going to go. If you meet the condition of one of these here, then you'll remove this from the task tile that it's on and you'll score this number of points at the end of the game. Then because there are three or excuse me, there are fewer than three task tiles in play, we would reveal another task tile. And again, we would discuss where we want it to go. Um, and that's just sort of how the game plays. We play through um, as many of the task tiles as we can possibly play through in a whole game because these are where the majority of our points come from. However, the game will end when we've run out of landscape tiles. So we, we might not get to very many of these if we don't do very well as we're putting those landscape tiles out. Um, but this is primarily where the points are gonna come from. So we play through until there are no more landscape tiles available. Um, and at the end of the game, we are gonna add up all the points we have we've earned by completing the task tiles that are out in the game. We'll also get points for having um, the longest, longest rails. possible railway that we can and the longest possible river. I think uh, they call it stream. a stream. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the longest possible stream and the longest possible railway get us points. I think it's one point per tile in that, yes. that length, right? Um, and then we also get points for having enclosed flags which are tiles in these landscape stacks. There are currently three of them in the game, but it sounds like based on the way that the rules are written, we may discover more of those as we play through more of the campaign. So there's currently three um, flags in the landscape tiles. There's one for green, one for yellow, and one for... The houses. Okay, the houses. Um, and the way that the flags work is they have they're associated with a specific color or like landscape type and what you want to do is you want to fully enclose that sort of landscape around that flag and for every piece of um, landscape of that type that's in that group if it's enclosed at the end you'll get a point with the flag in there um so the flags the railway the um waterway and then our tasks are where all of our points are gonna come from. At the end of the game, we're gonna add up all of our points and then we're going to compare it to this chart over here. There are um, numbers over here on this side and based on how well we did, we will get to mark off things. So Nick and I played one game already and we scored fewer than 100 points. Um, so we only got to mark off one box and you can see that we marked off one box. But if we'd done like better, maybe if we'd scored like, you know, 190 points or more, but less than 200, we could have actually marked off seven boxes and we would have gone through this whole chain here and, and been able to open boxes and get new things for the campaign and that kind of stuff. And without spoiling anything, especially because I don't know what is gonna be in these things, um, all of this is going to alter each of the games that we play. So when we open box one, there's gonna be new components that we get to incorporate into the game that may change what we're doing a little bit, or they may you know, add new types of landscape or new tasks or something like that. What I understand without spoiling is you just get uh, the ability to get more points. So, so you get uh, higher and higher. Okay, so, it's, so as we play through these games, hopefully we're scoring decent amounts of points so that we can mark off more and more bubbles on this track over here. And then, you know, we get to discover more and more components and ways to score and that kind of thing. So that is sort of an overview of Dwarf Romantic. Um, Nick and I are going to go ahead and play through our second game. Um, and we'll come back in a little while yeah, and we'll tell you back. what we think about it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll come back midway through and talk a little about how we're having our experience. Um, and then we'll keep playing until the end and then give final thoughts. And yeah, so let's get to it. All 
All right, people, people, we're back. So this is a little more than midway through the game. I feel like this game, if you get two people that work well together, you can just keep kind of going and really plow through this game. It does say 30 to 60 minutes. And I think with two players that could uh, work well together, um, you could definitely do it in 30 or under. If you're playing with six players, there's no way you're getting this done within an hour. It's at least two hours plus like teach and debate. Like you'd have to have like a debate timer. So I feel like I feel like in this game it it, it does not it, there's no like turns, right? Everybody is supposed to play together. So what's supposed to happen is you like reveal a tile and then we all discuss where it's best to be put. But to be honest, if I was playing with like more than three players, I would probably just be like it's going to be turn based and whoever's turn it is like we can all be like what i maybe i like i think it'd be good if you put it here but like ultimately it comes down to that person and they get to like choose and where they it's gonna do go. that. there's like an active player in the game oh okay i didn't realize that i think it would be a lot better than just like okay let's now convene a council on where the style should go with six people because that just stop alpha gaming just feels like that would not be fun so what do you think so far so um, this is our second game. The first game we played, honestly, for the first like half of the game, I was very much like, what is this dry, boring game where we don't have like very much agency at all? But after the first half of the first game, things started to feel a little bit more, okay, I'm starting to get into this. This is a little bit more interesting now. Um, and I actually think it's a really fun activity. I don't necessarily think that it's a game exactly, but it is a fun activity um, for a person to play alone or maybe to play with two or three people if you work well together in a group. Um, it's interesting. It's got this puzzle aspect to it. You're just revealing one single tile at a time and then trying to figure out how you can best meet these different goals that you're aiming for and that kind of stuff. Um, and as you turn over more and more tiles, you grow more and more of this sort of landscape and um, different things start to develop and it becomes, you know, interesting to figure out, well, I've got this one housing area that I could put this in, uh, but I also have this other one over here that's, you know, emerging that it might be a good place to put it because also it connects this extra river or whatever. So it starts to get more interesting the further into the game you get, I think. Um, and it also gets i think a little bit faster because you have more like right now in we have three tasks you're always supposed to have three tasks out so right now our three tasks are that we need five housing hexagons in this area six water in this one and six railroad in this one this one right here we have five of the six we just need one more and we'll complete this one um same thing with this here we have one two three four of the fives so we'll complete that soon um, we only have half of the railroad over here, but it's fairly fast paced in that, like, if you turn over, you know, a water tile, you're like, okay, well, if we put it here, we'll complete that task. Um, and that'll get us six points. And it will also help us to get more tasks out, um, hopefully before the end of the game, so that we can do more of them and score more points. So um, it starts to become, I think, more interesting the further into the game you get. Um, there's also these flags I talked about earlier. So we've revealed all three in our game. Um, and the way that the flags work is you have these sort of like areas where territories, um, yeah, territories where there's like all of this sort of farmland. Um, and at the end of the game, if this area is completely finished, which means there are no openings, um, then we'll score one point for every tile in that sort of like farmland. Um, so those become interesting too, because then you're like, okay, well, we're trying to meet these conditions, but we're also trying to make sure that we don't get, don't lose points by neglecting this area over here and not getting it closed in by the end of the game. Um, I feel like right now there's, um, there's just enough to balance um, you know, there's things competing for your attention, but it doesn't feel like you're being pulled in too many different directions. Um, I feel like they could probably add like one or two more objectives to a game and it would still feel like, 
okay, this is a puzzle, it would probably tighten up just a little bit. And that might not necessarily be bad, but I do hope that as we uncover more of the content of the game, that it doesn't become like a game where you're just like, well, it's impossible for us to even accomplish all of this stuff. So don't worry about X, Y, and Z, just focus on this because there's no way we're gonna be able to do it all. I don't really like games like that. So I hope it doesn't turn into that as we discover more of the content. Um, but so far, I think, like I said, for two or three players, or even as a solo experience, um, I think this is really fun. I don't think that I would want to do this with more than three players, though. Maybe, maybe it would just be like the best time ever, but um, it doesn't seem like it. So that's my current thoughts on Dorf Romantic. Dorf Romantic. Yeah, so I pretty much am similar thoughts on it. I definitely wouldn't want to play this. I don't even know if I would want to play this with more than two players. Uh, three just seems like, I don't know, too many people. Um, but uh, I think it really does excel at a solo play because I feel like this is also a video game. It was first a video game and now it is a board game. So, um, so yeah, there's that. And uh, I think it does really well solo. And it's nice that it's a campaign, but also there's multiple- to play with me. No, no. <laughs> but um, uh, it also has multiple sheets. So you can, uh, unlike a legacy game, a legacy game, you're destroying pieces and marking things up permanently, permanently where it can't be uh, changed back to where you can play the game from the start. And you could play, you know, a solo after you play with others. You can play with different player counts. Um, and it's nice that there are multiple sheets, multiple score pads, multiple campaigns, uh, even though if you know everything uh, that comes in the game, like uh, I showed briefly going over the um, campaign page, uh, there's multiple ways you can go about the uh, campaign. So you can also reveal things differently in later campaigns that you do, do this game in. So even if you know what's coming, you could release it in a different order, which is which is cool. Nice replayability. Still, don't think I would want to do this with more than two, max three people. And I think this is uh, probably a great solo experience. So we are gonna go ahead and get back into it and come back to you at the end of the game after we finished, scored, and seen where we're at. And obviously say before we reveal anything, spoiler alert and all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, so we're going to get back into it and we'll see you guys at the end of the game and yeah, we'll talk to you then. Toodles! Hey, people, people, how's it going? <laughs> so we just finished our game of Dorf Rom... Oh, gosh, I keep messing I'm this up. I'm pretty sure it's Dorf Romantic. Dorf Romantic, yes. I'm pretty sure as well it's Dorf Romantic. And we did one point better than our first game. So we are technically getting better and did better than our first game. And at the end of our what we thought, we get to open the first box because we finally painstakingly got to the first box so we can get more more uh more points hopefully in uh, uh games to come so let's go ahead and start off with sarah with uh, a little bit of our roundup of uh the end of the game and then we'll start with her thoughts so let's do it sarah do you mind so it is exciting we do get to open box one which we will do here in a minute so no spoilers just yet and we'll tell you before we do anything that will spoil stuff uh so yeah so the game is over we've added up all of our points um we did get 81 points which like nick said is one more point than the first game we played Woo! Um, which was also the last game we played um so we what we did was we at the end of the game you fill out this little score sheet sort of thing um you you look at all the tasks you completed throughout the game. So these are all the tasks we finished. You add all those up. You also get points from the flags, like I said, um, and for your longest contiguous river and uh, railway. 
Um, and basically you add up all of those points and that's your score. So we added up everything and we had 81 points. Um, so then you compare your point value to this track over here um, from zero to 99. You are vagabonds and you can get uh, one X that you X out on the sheet. So I've already done that. It's this one here. As soon as you get to one of these hexagons on this sheet, then you get to do whatever it says. So it says that we get to open box one, which we are going to do in a minute after we talk about the wrap up of the game so that you can listen to our wrap up if you want to without being spoiled. Uh, but then we will open this and see what's inside. <laughs> what did you think of the game, Nick? So um, when I first was reading the rules on this game and kind of feeling it out, I was kind of thinking, I, I thought I wasn't going to like it. And this is before I uh, knew that this was going to be a Spiel, uh, was it a Spiel de Jar nominee. And I was kind of like, eh, this doesn't seem like something I'd want to play or I wouldn't enjoy. And also would think that, um, again, six... <laughs> one to six players like ah i don't i definitely wouldn't want to play with play this with a lot of people but after playing it it is definitely uh, something that i would recommend to lower player counts for like three or less oh, but who knows but but who knows you can we haven't played it with more people and <clears throat> you might enjoy it with more people uh just that camaraderie uh the cooperative nature of this game so yeah that might be something that you enjoy and or get your you friends commit or you want to might want to commit violence because someone's alpha gaming and <laughs> this game is trying to uh squash that by the active player in it but still someone there's might be like you much, should you should do it <laughs> there's just not very much for like non-active players to do in this yeah. game i think and if you had to wait five turns until your turn, I think it would just kind of be sort of boring, maybe. Hmm. But uh, other than that, it was it's interesting just to see what patterns come out and what uh, landscape tiles that you can kind of finagle and try to get uh, your points. It's interesting with the campaign mode and writing down which game you got the score in and... Um, how many points and then also opening up boxes getting achievements getting new abilities so that is something uh is that is uh, that i'm looking forward to within the game so i want to play more of this and i don't just want to be done i want to get into it more which is a a, a straw in its hat or a feather in its cap and uh something that i would like to play but if one if you aren't someone that likes cooperative games and uh wouldn't want to do this as a solo, then this is probably not the game for you, to be honest, just because it's a Spiel de Jar. The Spiel de Jar is more of a family-friendly uh, kind of games that get picked for that. Also, um, as far as I can tell, there's no winning, right? Like, you just, you get you just, a score you based, do. and you, like, yeah, so, we like, collectively, we get a cumulative score or total, and then you sort of compare it to this chart, and you get stuff for that, but there's yeah. no, like, You've won, <laughs> you know. You just how did you do? Yeah, you're just kind of, and I think maybe that's partially. Did you PR, man? Did you PR? I think that's partially why maybe I am not entirely sure that I feel like it's a game exactly. It's more of an activity um, because we don't really seem to like win or lose. Um, you just did. You just did something, which was fun, but to me that's more of an activity than a game, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I would kind of more agree that it's more of an activity than a game. Um, but that's why I would recommend this as like a solo play. Because you're not winning. You're just basically, if you play this as a solo game, you're basically at least facing yourself in future games. Like, okay, my last game, I only got this many points. So let me go ahead and see if I can't do better. And uh, yeah, so that's the only thing I can kind of see. But if you want to be like, I won in a game, this is not the game that uh, will give you that satisfaction. Uh, it's more of just like, an, like, like Sarah said, an activity to go ahead and just do, but yeah. I do think it's an activity that's fun for two players though. Um, I don't really like solo gaming. Uh, I, I prefer to game because I want to like spend time with a person or with people um, and play a game while we do it. Um, so I personally don't love solo gaming very much. Um, so I would rather do this with one or two other people. 
um, I think, than just do it by myself. Um, if I play a game by myself, at the end of it, I'm like, okay, well, I had fun, but like, I could have been doing a lot of other things that I would have had fun doing, and I'd have rather have done this with other people. Um, so I like want to spend my 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 solo free time doing things that I would like to do alone, um, and like my gaming time, I'd like to spend like with other people. Um, so for me, I don't think that I would prefer to do this as a solo experience. Um, but I did think that it was a really fun thing to do with another person. Um, because you're just kind of you're working together, but it's it's this very casual it's a sort team, of team building exercise. Yeah, it's just just like a pleasant time to like spend together building this you know this beautiful landscape starts to you know um, emerge as you play, and it's very casual, it's very light, it's very simple, um, and, but it's it's a, just a nice way to like spend time with another person. I think. Um, so for me, I liked doing it with someone else. I don't think I would like to do it by myself. But Nick says that he would like to do it by himself. So take that how you will. Do you have any other points to this? Um, I do think it's really cool to see how things start to kind of emerge. Um, as you're playing, you're making strategic decisions about where to place the tiles that you're turning out so that you can meet certain objectives and so that you can do certain things. But it also creates this landscape that emerges and it. it starts to look pretty cool. Um, I also think it's, it, I like that they have the points per tile in the longest river and railway because towards the end of the game, um, when you have fewer and fewer tiles, you know that you're probably not going to meet some of your, like these were our last objectives and we were pretty close on this one and this one. Um, and we still had like nine tiles left when we had these two out. So I thought, okay, in nine tiles, it feels likely that we could maybe accomplish one of these. But as you're turning out those last few tiles, you are, um, turning out things that don't help you with objectives. And because you know no further objectives are going to come out, then there's no reason to build up other spaces in preparation for the potential that other objectives might come out. So because of that, there can be tiles that are sort of just throwaway tiles. Um, I know that we can't use this to complete one of the objectives that's already out, and I know no other objectives will come out. So we don't need this tile. This isn't a useful tile. Um, but if it's water or a railway, you can at least extend your, what is this? Creek? Stream. stream. You can at least extend your stream or your railway um, and get, you know, a point or two for the tiles that you place there at the end of the game. So I think that they, um, they maintained, like, my interest, even when there were fewer and fewer tiles to work with and we needed really specific tiles. Um, so I think that, that would, that's a good design decision because it meant that there were no tiles that were just worthless. At the, well, there were few, very just very few tiles at the end of the game where we just like really couldn't do anything with it. Um, so yeah, I think it's a very fun experience, especially for a low player count. Um, and I really like how, how, like, it sort of unfolds, um, and I think that it's solid. I'm excited to see what's in some of the, like, hidden content as we progress through the game, um, and see, like, how it unfolds. But the first couple of games have been a lot of fun, and I've been, I'm enjoying it so far. Do you think this will win the Spiel des Jahres? Ah, uh, so I, I keep up with some of that stuff a little bit, but I don't know what it's going against. Me either. Um, I, I know vaguely of the two other ones, but not enough. Uh, I personally think it's a solid game, and it feels like a Spiel winner. So I could, if, if you told me that this game had won a Spiel, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, but I because I don't know what it's going up against, I'm not willing to say that it will definitely win. Um, strong contender, I think, though. What do you think? Do you think it's going to win, Nick? I think it's going to win. I think the others are... I don't know them. Uh, 
preferably well, really well at all, but I just think this being a previous um, video game and now board game and it's doing already so well, I think there's just a writing in the sand that this might be the, uh, the winner. Um, but I could be wrong. Again, I'm not on the committee for the Spiel des Jahres, and nor do I think I should be. <laughs> I'd be like, wait, what? You want me to do what? This is this is a very impactful to me. I feel like it's a, any you know, big award uh, is impactful, but um, for a game and its future and its sales and all that. So I'd be a little little a little pressured. Uh, I, I think did, Sarah has the I other was nominees. Say, I did look up what the other nominees were. They were just announced yesterday. This is for Spiel des Jahres 2023. Um, and if you don't know what that is, there's a little intro here. It says it is the most prestigious annual award for board games. Um, and they also do the Kinderspiel um, and the Kinderspiel, which are for like younger players. And then there's the other one for like, more intense players, I think. Okay. Well, the... Uh, up for the Spiel de Jar, which is the game of the year, is Dwarf Romantic. Um, it is there's up against Fun Facts and Next Station London, which I don't know anything at all about Fun Facts, but Next Station London is on my list of games that I am interested in and would like to play. Um, let's see. It says that those are the only three up for nomination for Game of the Year. Um, and then the, for the Kinnerspiel, uh, which is the Enthusiast's Game of the Year, uh, there are games called Challengers, uh, Ikey or Icky maybe, um, and Planet Unknown. And then for the... Kinderspiel, which is the children's game of the year. Carla Caramel is one. Gigamon is another. And Mysterium Kids is the third. I think Mysterium Kids is going to take that one. Um, I have never heard of either of the other two. Yeah. So but... Mysterium Kids seems likely for the, the kids game. Um, I'm hoping that Planet Unknown wins the Kinnerspiel, which is the Enthusiast Game Award, because I know the publisher of that game is a really nice guy. So it would be nice for me personally if if he won. Um, so we're calling it Dwarf Romantic, Planet Unknown, and Mysterium Kids. Yep, that's what I think too. If we're right, we gotta go play our numbers in the lottery. <laughs> All right, uh, I think it's time, Sarah, for our box. Let's do it. Spoiler. Are we gonna do this on camera? Yeah. Okay. So if you do not want to know what is in Dwarf Romantic box number one, we love you. Go away. If you do want to know, if you do want to know, here we go. Cards. Oh, all kinds of things. So there's some cards. There's some new tiles. Uh, there's this little heart token. And then there are some new task numbers and i don't think we had any fours previously did no, we? no we did we did it fours. Oh, we, we, did just, we just didn't pull any of the fours okay, let's see so now we've got some extra fours one for each of the categories we've got this little heart we've got oh there's a cute little fox on this tile um it looks like these are all new um task tiles one for each of the categories nice. and it looks like there's there's some people on these here and then some animals on these which is nice and then we also have these cards. There are three cards. One is a list of contents. It says there are five task tiles, five value four task markers, which we are gonna mix in with all of these. It says there's a achievement unlocked card for the red hearts. Um, there is a wooden heart and there is a hearts desires achievement card. Um, and then there's some some tips on this card here for fulfilling the tasks. Um, so it looks like we did unlock two new achievement cards. The first one um, is that we get to on our campaign sheet under our achievements section, which is right over here, we get to mark off red hearts. And it says 
From the next game onwards, during setup, place the red hearts you have unlocked on the edge of your play area so they'll be easily accessible. And then it gives us a new rule. You may place a red heart on a landscape tile that has just been placed, but not on a special or task tile. It remains there until the end of the game. It will score points for each edge of the tile on it that matches the six adjacent tiles. Um, and then there's an example on the back. Q. So we've got sort of a new rule and maybe some sort of new objectives with the heart tile. And then the other achievement card says, from the next game onwards, during setup, place this card next to your area with the uh, closed lock face up. You can now unlock the achievement Heart's Desire. Um, and if we do that, we gain six points from one red heart at the end of the game. And if you do, then turn this card over. And so we kind of, we have like, that's like a step sort of thing. We'll try to achieve this here. And if we do, then we get to turn this card over. And it, on the other side of the card, it says, on your campaign sheet under your achievements, cross off Heart's Desire, and you may now open box Four. So oh, if we can snap. if we can manage to do this, then we'll get to um, lock, knock off another achievement and open another box. Um, yeah. So that was everything in box one, and uh, it looks like we have a few new things to sort of aim for in the next couple of games. More points. Um, so I am looking forward to continuing the campaign. Do you have any idea like how many games we are going to play? Um, I don't. I guess how how good we are. Yeah, it so that like we said earlier, this sort of chart right here indicates how many circles you get to cross off based on how well you did. So the higher you score, the more circles that you can cross off. I'd assume you know if we get if we get pretty good, we're going to be crossing off quite a few circles. But there's still lots and lots of circles over here. So I suspect it's going to be ten or more games probably before we we finish with this campaign here and then like Nick was saying earlier um it's it it's fully replayable we'll know obviously what you know what's in box one at the very beginning of the game but it will um sort of reset so you can play it again and again and again and just kind of see as things you know come out differently each time so that's exciting I'm going to do a little bit of admin based on what we've been instructed to do here and Nick will wrap up the video I guess yeah well, everybody, we hope you enjoyed this video of Dwarf Romantic, a uh, Spiel des Jahres nominee. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you are rooting for your game that uh, wins the Spiel and all the other Tell us uh, which ones you're interested in. Tell us which ones you want to win, if you have a favorite that you are hoping wins one of those awards. Or tell us if you think that there's a game that should have been nominated but wasn't. So leave those in the comments below. And uh, yeah, we hope you enjoyed this video and we will see you guys on the next one. So without further ado, we'll see y'all later. Play games. Toodles!